our purpose today is to give you a very brief overview of the Common Core state standards, how they were initially developed, some of the major provisions, and then we're going to ask you eventually to do a little reflection on what you're seeing, hearing, and reading today. Uh, there is a lot of controversy about the Common Core state standards. Our overview, the first uh, part of the PowerPoint, is going to try and keep opinions out. <laughs> These will be just the facts, as, as they say. So one of the first things that we want to take a look at is what exactly is the Common Core state standards? What are the Common Core state standards? Um, there is a rich history uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about in class and you can read about online. Uh, but for purposes of just the facts, we want to make sure that you know that they became the Connecticut Core Standards in July of 2010. Uh, there are a number of components, most of which uh, that are important for our discussion here, is uh, that we'll focus on the college and career readiness, uh, the anchor standards that are used for grades K through 12 students. There are ELA content standards in grades K through 12. Right now there are math content and practice standards in K through 12. Uh, there are also literacy standards that apply to history, social studies, science, and technical subjects in grades six, six through 12. Uh, but then the big question is, what about science and social studies content area standards? Uh, just a, a clarification on what we're talking about with technical subjects. A technical subject is considered any subject in which procedural knowledge is taught. So there's a lot of rationale for the Common Core. Um, on this one you see CCSS, we're talking about the Common Core State Standards. Uh, most of this was motivated by race to the top money from the federal government. Uh, it's stimulus money meant to motivate states to implement and run with uh, the Common Core State Standards. This is also uh, motivated by business, business and industry concerned with the level of quality of individuals they are getting from uh, K through 12 populations, make sure that they're ready for the workplace of the future. Uh, this is also motivated by concerns that the government, both federal and state, and also business and industry have about uh, U.S. students and how competitive they are in relation to other students from around the world. Um, it's up to you to decide uh, how much of this plays into the Common Core and how it's implemented. It's interesting to note that this uh, document was not created by educators. Um, another interesting point is that the race to the top incentive was not guaranteed to states who agreed to participate. There are currently 45 states on board with the CCSS. Connecticut is one of them. The reason Connecticut got involved was primarily because uh, we were interested in uh, getting some of that race to the top money. And the really interesting thing is we didn't get any of it. So there are uh, numerous uh, elements of the Common Core, m m all of which you'll have to dig into deeper. We'll do part in this class, but also there's an expectation that as a professional, you know the Common Core backwards and forwards, and your administrators in your buildings are going to want to know how you're embedding Common Core into instruction. Uh, there are uh, key shifts that occur in the Common Core, uh, and this guides most of the complexity of the standards. So we, we focus on reading, writing, speaking and listening, language, uh, and then the, the technical science, history, social studies uh, standards, and, at, and how they apply to reading and writing. In terms of reading, one of the shifts is that we need to focus on a balance of literature and informational text. We need to focus on text complexity and text-dependent questions. In terms of writing, uh, there's a big emphasis on argumentation in writing, and you'll see this across the content areas. There's also emphasis on uh, informational text and explanatory text and having students create these, and also writing from sources. Uh, in terms of speaking, speaking and listening, some of the shifts that we discuss or we focus on in the Common Core 
is there is an inclusion and a rec uh, recognition, is that a word? We recognize formal and informal talk. Uh, and then in terms of language, we need to understand that there is academic vocabulary and there's domain specific vocabulary that our students have to be able to use. Uh, we talked about this in class, how some of the times we, we want our students to think like a historian in social studies class or think or read uh, or write uh, at like a musician in our music classes. So that's where this com uh, comes into this. Uh, in terms of the last component, the, one of the key pieces here, especially for content area teachers, is that all of this does not happen and it's not supposed to happen solely within the ELA or reading classroom. We're focusing on these shifts as a literacy and that means it's the responsibility for all teachers rather than just content area teachers or ELA teachers or reading teachers or insert, you know, a f area here. In this combined version of this class, we will be concentrating most of our efforts on the first two bullet points, reading and writing, and the last, the standards for reading and writing in the content and technical subjects. Uh, one of the key components that we talked about uh, earlier, and this can't be said enough, is there's a, a focus on text complexity and really understanding why you're putting a specific text in front of your students and making sure they understand well first of all making sure that you know why you put that in front of the kids and there's numerous levels to that but also why that specific text so in terms of text complexity there's a couple reasons why this is a challenge and why it's so prevalent in the common core one is that uh, through various research studies they notice that text complexity is continuing to decline in subject areas um, and there's some keynotes here, some uh, facts here on this slide, but basically there is a general concern that we are uh, decreasing the level of complexity of text, decreasing the, the scope of the vocab that we use. Um, we are shortening sentences up in textbooks for our students, and that presents challenges as they are supposed to improve across grade levels in literacy practices. We will be spending more time on this, uh, this topic in class, but it's important to uh, say at this particular time that text complexity is not dependent on the difficulty level of the text. It's more dependent on what we as teachers choose to do with the text. So we can take what may seem to be a very simple read and increase the complexity of this by asking more of students, asking different types of questions, and asking them to think about the text in different ways. There are numerous factors that help determine text complexity. These are detailed in the Common Core State Standards. These are also detailed in the Achieve the Core website that we will link you to. The Achieve the Core website does a really good job of helping you unpack this and understand what they're getting at. But basically they view text complexity as being three component factors. Uh, the first of which is the quantitative component. And what we're talking about here is lexile level, um, you know, reading level. We're talking about word length and frequency and sentence length and um, text complexity within uh, the specific document that you're giving to kids. There's also a qualitative component that we'll talk about in a slide or two. And there's also reader and task considerations. For the most part, the quantitative piece is relatively easy to understand. The, um, well, we have for quantitative. Okay. So, I mean, quantitative, we're looking at lexile levels. And pretty much what we're thinking about with lexile levels is that we have a number. We have a, a grade level equivalency, so when we look at a specific text, we know what grade level uh, student can handle that text. The assumption is the lexile level of kids, uh, of uh, readings for uh, students in grades 9 through 12 is going to be around uh, 1050. And you see on this slide that there are uh, 
uh, references to uh, the lexile level of the sort of things that adult readers look at all the time. Um, we may not all look at the Wall Street Journal, but we sure all have to look at federal income tax forms. We, uh, if, if we're parents, we need to look at installing our child's safety seat, etc. So most of the things that we as adults will read are at least a thousand. And I just had to reinstall a child's safety seat the other day, a booster seat, and I think that this Lexile level is way too low. Um, I think it should be much higher. Uh, keep in mind that in your classroom, you have students at varying skill and ability levels. Uh, you have every single one of your students has an individualized educational plan. They have different needs as a reader. And so you might be teaching 10th or 11th grade. Um, and so that would, the, the consideration would be that your kids would be reading at uh, at 1,000 or 1,100 reading level, but you might have a bunch of kids in there that are reading at a Lexile level, or they can approach a Lexile level uh, far below that. Uh, you might also have kids that read above that level. Um, so there are multiple factors at play here, but you need to be considerate of the Lexile level of the piece that you're giving to your kids, and is it appropriate or not? There's also the qualitative assessment and this takes a little bit more time and it takes a more thought process. The Common Core identifies four areas that they use to assess uh, the qualitative elements of the text that you're giving to your students. And all of you need to consider this when you put text in front of your students. Um, the first is levels of meaning and purpose. And explicitly what that means is, is it too hard for them to understand? Is it, is it very theoretical? Is it abstract? Um, or is it relatively easy for them to understand? Is the level of meaning and the level of purpose pretty simple? Uh, structure talks about textual features, organization of the text. Are there lots of graphics and tables and charts used? Or is it pretty easy for the students to use the structure of the text to identify what's happening in the text? Uh, language features. What we're talking about here is grammar and sentence structure, language conventions, the type of vocab that the text uses, you know, the author of the text uses, and then uh, also the knowledge demands of the text. That's pretty much twofold. What is the subject matter knowledge necessary in order to understand that text? And then one of the more challenging pieces here, are there intertextual references that are in the text that would impede students from reading? So. Uh, if you're reading a piece of literature, are there references to some arcane text that they need to know or a poem? If there's uh, subject matter text, if there's a science textbook, is it, are there a lot of references to other textbooks or other pieces of your subject matter that kids need to know before they read that piece? Um, so those are the, these are four assessments, four elements of qualitative assessment of text. That last bullet point, the knowledge demands you might think of as being uh, uh, a piece that we see on our uh, lesson plan template, the uh, background knowledge, and that's really what that uh, piece on the lesson plan is speaking to. What do kids need to know in order to learn this new idea or access this new text? So keep in mind when we're picking a text, we're thinking about three things. We're thinking about the quantitative assessment of the text, and that means primarily, but is not limited to, the lexile level or the reading level, and that's a number. Um, then we're talking about the qualitative piece, and that includes the elements that we had on the last slide. Um, that's levels of meaning and purpose, structure, language features, and knowledge demands. And then the, the last component in consideration of the text is the, the thought process around the reader and the task. And this is what Pat was alluding to earlier. Is this the best text for your students at this given time? And this basically helps you parse out all of the levels of complexity that exist as we have students read, or as we have students write, or as we have students communicate and use text among each other, you know, within the classroom for learning purposes. So there's a lot of variables that are going to affect what the kids do. Uh, we know that motivation is always a huge component. We know from our ed psych classes that motivation 
is one of the contexts and contingencies that affects how kids read, write, and succeed in class. Also, prior knowledge and experience. Uh, do you, are you teaching science to a student that loves science or is a little bit phobic of dealing in science? Um, the purpose for the reading. It makes a di big difference if you let your students know why they're doing a specific activity and why they're learning exactly what they're learning. Uh, that's going to affect whether or not the text is right for the kids. Uh, the last two components on there is complexity of the task, uh, assigned regarding the text, and then the complexity of the questions. So once again, what are you having the students do with that text? That's going to affect whether or not it's the best text for them. These last two bullet points speak to the, uh, the uh, Bloom's taxonomy and the upper levels, which push kids to think more critically and creatively. Okay, the, uh, there's a lot of controversy over this piece of the, the Common Core. Um, if you take a look at the chart, you can see that the core expects students in grades K through five to uh, read roughly 50% of literary texts and 50% informational texts. This changes in the next grade level band, six through eight. The, literacy, the literary texts are decreased a bit and the informational texts are increased and that um, decrease of literary text is even greater in grades 9 through 12 with more emphasis placed on informational texts. Some of the controversy over this piece has or, or comes from the concerns of English language arts teachers who um, feel that especially in the middle and upper grades that they're not going to be allowed to teach the literary texts that uh, they feel are so important to the, the content area. But the important thing to remember is these numbers, which are across um, a row total 100%, are spread throughout all of the content areas that students are studying in uh, any given year. So that means that the English language arts teacher can still spend more time using literary texts because the 70%, the, uh, much of that is going to be taken up by the history teachers, the uh, science teachers, um, uh, some math teachers, whatever the, the other content areas are. So we're spreading the wealth, if you will. Um, everything is not uh, in the purview of only the English language arts teacher. Now some of the questions that you should have as you view this chart include the following. Uh, number one, do you know what is meant by literary text or informational text? Um, that's a key concern. Uh, we need to use the terminology the Common Core uses. Uh, you may not see your colleagues and peers in the schools using it, uh, but that's what the Common Core calls it, and that's what we should use in our day-to-day -day interactions. Also, one of the questions you should have is that we know from educational research that a lot of times we like to lump kids into these boxes and say, in grades six or eight, this is what you should be doing. Uh, very rarely in life does that occur. This is a guide, a framework from the Common Core. Um, but then there's also a bigger question about, as Pat indicated, you know, this changing influence of informational texts and this reliance on informational texts. And you have to ask yourself, is that really best practices? Um, and once again, this is something that the Common Core espouses, but it's a question about what makes sense for you in your content or in your classroom. You know, the one of the questions that I have to ask you is, right now, as an adult, what balance do you have? What percentage of your life is spent reading and working with literary texts as opposed to informational texts? Remember that the purpose of the, the uh, impetus, I guess you will, for the Common Core is to ensure that students are both career and college ready. And uh, in most careers, 
and uh, in most college experiences, um, except of course if, if you're going to be an English major perhaps, uh, but in, in uh, most of the other content areas, students will be reading more informational texts than anything else. And in life, as adults, we probably read more informational texts than anything else. Now, one of the challenges that we have is, you know, literacy really is at its simplest form reading and writing. And a lot of times we uh, give short shrift to writing when we think about it in our classroom, whether it's language arts or the content areas. Um, we are both big proponents of writing and see a lot of power in writing. And the Common Core tries to include the, the level of importance that writing should have. Um, and so what they do is they look at the changing rationale of writing or the purpose of writing. Um, and so that also is changing the way that we address writing in our class with our students, our expectations of uh, the why and the what of, of writing in writing instruction. And so basically the Common Core specifies why these students would be writing and, and for what purpose. Uh, notice in particular in, uh, for grades 9 through 12 that uh, there is greater emphasis placed on uh, persuasion and uh, writing to inform and much less emphasis placed on uh, narrative. But remember that in both persuasive and informational writing, you do occasionally use some narrative techniques, so it's not like that we're really excluding narrative completely. We're just using narrative techniques in a different way and to emph emphasize different things. And one of the big components here is that persuade uh, and, and argumentation of writing is here. Um, you know, one of the, the nice things about the Common Core is that argumentation and writing really is picking up steam. Um, those of you that are in science, uh, this has been a part of your, your standards for a couple of years now, and now it's nice to see some of the other disciplines and the other content areas pick up pace uh, in terms of addressing argumentation and writing. So in terms of assessment, um, one of the key components that we talked about earlier is that the Common Core State Standards is a big factor in the classroom you will need to identify how you're addressing Common Core in instruction. Uh, you will need to identify and frame your lesson plans based upon specific Common Core standards. Most of you uh, will be able to use college and career readiness anchor standards that are in the Common Core. Uh, the, the simple reason is the, the college and career readiness skills that are identified in the, in the Common Core basically identify students that are ready willing and able to succeed in the world. So those of us that are teaching in secondary populations, which is all of you, need to be able to say that when your cherubs leave 12th grade or whatever grade they're going to stay there until, are they ready? Are they college and career ready? If you're not addressing those skills, if you're not building up those skills with your students, then you are not attending to those elements of the Common Core and you are failing your students for when they leave. They're not college and career ready. So in terms of the other reason why this is hugely important is there are uh, a series of assessments starting up. Uh, there is the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium or the Smarter Balance or the SBAC tests that are starting up. Uh, those are the ones that are happening in Connecticut and other states. There's also the PARC tests, P-A-R-C-C, uh, that's starting up in Massachusetts and other states. There are other states that are addressing if they are getting, uh, if they are part of the Common Core initiative, they are either a smarter balanced state or a park state, or they need to indicate how they're assessing the Common Core. And these assessments are starting up. I believe last year there were some states that used pilot versions of uh, this test, but in uh, certainly in Connecticut, uh, there will be a pilot run this spring. Uh, but next year, 2015, uh, students will be tested for real. Another key component we need to think about with the PARC assessment and the Smarter Balance test is that this is all uh, computer adaptive as assessment and it's also artificially scored, uh, artificial AI scored. And what that means is uh, children need to sit down in front of computers 
and take the assessment. So this would be rolled out online, this would be rolled out on computers, it will be scored primarily by computers, and it will address the, the Common Core State Standards, will know exactly what's being assessed, but it will happen on a computer. So we have significant questions about the way that this is being rolled out and how students and instructors are being prepared. We have significant questions about, or at least we should, about the reliability, validity, the standardization practices, and the practicality of these assessments. Um, there is a long test window for these assessments. Um, it's suggested that we might see a 12-week or longer test window uh, for students. Um, you should have your own questions about the validity and the practicality of that in your population. Uh, there's also, uh, do you want to talk about how it relates to the CAP test and the CMTs? Mm -hmm. If it does? <laughs> Actually, I, I really don't know mm -hmm. how, how much it does relate. I think the challenge is that, at least in the state of Connecticut, we've had a rich history of the frameworks and the standards. The Common Core came in, and for the most part, we basically eliminated the old standards and frameworks and copy-pasted in the Common Core. Uh, the state of Connecticut is trying to adapt to uh, the SBAC in, as a Common Core assessment. And so one of the challenges that all of you will address, and it will be a big issue uh, in the next two to three years and probably beyond that, is for those students in your classroom that have an IEP and need modifications for a test, those are very carefully delineated for the CMTs and the CAP tests, um, but what happens on the Smarter Balance? Uh, so this is one of the challenges that we're going to see is how does the IEP uh, interact with this assessment? It's my understanding that the uh the assessment is going to be somewhat intuitive, so if the student answers a question in one way, that will determine the next question the student is asked. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but it will be equally interesting to see how that actually plays out. Yeah. So, so I mean, once again, this is an overview of the Common Core State Standards. We will drill down into greater complexity as time permits. Uh, there are numerous components in here. There is um, a debate, you know, air quotes debate that's underway. But the fact of the matter remains that this is a state, and for the most part, it's not really, but for the most part, it is a federal standard. This is something that you need to attend to in your classroom. This is something that your students need to uh, learn and, and know the skills, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions identified in the Common Core, and this is something that you need to roll into your planning. So that is the bare bones, just the facts version of the Common Core, as much as we could keep it vanilla. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's important that, as Ian said, you learn as much about this as you possibly can, and everybody's going to have an opinion about it. What are the positives? What are the negatives? How is it going to impact your classroom? But um, the essence of this is that regardless of what your opinion is, it's a fact of life for us if we're teaching in a public school classroom in Connecticut and actually in most of, of the other states. So you need to know what to do about it, how to address the, uh, the standards, how to embed them into your program, and hopefully over the next few weeks we'll give you a little bit more information on that. Now as a test to see how many of you actually follow through to the end and are still listening, the key word is albatross. So if you can work the word albatross into your paper, uh, we'll give you extra credit because we want to see who is actually paying attention and listen to the whole entire video.